uh, school, and his most uh, recent book, or his new book, is also the title of his presentation tonight. I do just want to let you know that during the Q&A, there are microphones set up in the center on either side of the aisle, and so for the film crew, so they can hear the questions when you are going to ask a question, if you would like to ask a question, please come to the one of the two microphones. Okay, so thank you very much. So the title of the presentation is The End of Normal, and I think really the the most important point to make about Jamie Galbraith for all of us is that he is clearly the most important public intellectual today speaking to matters related to the economy. So please join me in extending a warm welcome to James K. Galbraith. Matt, thank you very much. And it's, for me, I, true, it's a really a pleasure to be here. I can see so many of uh, my friends and people I have uh, admired for many years who are here tonight. At the end of yesterday's plenary session, I caught the gist of an argument over whether the great crisis that reached its boiling point in 2008, 2009, was financial, or whether it was something deeper, namely structural. And there were also interesting allusions to the role of imbalances and a pointed question about the place of fraud in the larger picture. And I want to touch on all of these issues this evening, but also to place them uh, in what I hope will be something approaching a coherent setting. So just to begin, that discussion yesterday seemed to me uh, to call attention to the need to be careful about the meaning of words and to be alert to the fact that uh, they don't always mean the same thing to different people. For instance, are structural and financial two distinct things? Is there a real economy and a financial economy? I think any careful reader of Minsky, not to mention Davidson, would say not. I will argue a little later on that one deeply structural aspect of the situation we now, now face is the breakdown of finance. The breakdown in specific, specifically of financial institutions. Let's also consider this word crisis. That too tends, particularly if you consider it casually, to convey a certain set of notions. I think the notion in particular of a temporally limited sequence of events, something that happens and then is over. A shock, perhaps. The two things are not, in fact, close synonyms, but they can be, I think, 
uh, conflated in many people's minds. That is to say, a shock to a previously not in crisis system. And I think if you take that perspective on the concept of crisis, then you will fall into a pattern of thinking which characterizes most of the uh, work of interpretation that has been offered up by economists so far on the events of uh, five, six, and seven years ago. What we have, I think, by and large, not I think in every case, but in practically all of them, is a panoply of what I call one-note narratives. That is a single themed essential causes of the crisis. And one of the things I do at the, in the early uh, pages of this new book, The End of Normal, is to lay out for the reader a number of those one-note narratives. There is, for example, the black swan view. The black swan view holds that, well, bad things happen occasionally. And therefore, uh, while one can't predict them in their specific occurrence, they don't t give us any new information about the nature of the system or any particular guidance on what needs to be changed. Black swans, of course, the concept is that they are very rare. There is a modification of that view, or an alternative, which we'll call the fat tails hypothesis, uh, which holds that bad things happen, but actually quite a bit more frequently than one might expect under the black swan's view. But still, even under the fat tails hypothesis, the expected value of change in any given time is zero. You know, can have, the events can happen on either tail of the distribution. And although disasters happen frequently, uh, the fat tails hypothesis gives you no comfort that you can uh, effectively change or reform the system and no particular policy guidance. Moving along into the domain of uh, policy economics, there was a very clear articulation of a causal force behind this crisis in the um, dissenting views of the uh, Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission report, uh, particularly the views of Mr. Uh, Peter Wallison, who held uh, that the crisis was caused by government having uh, interfered in the otherwise exemplary functioning of the free market by uh, the um, well-intentioned but foolish desire to put poor people into houses that they owned. And that this was therefore the product of the policy of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the Department of Housing and Urban Development operating under the Community Reinvestment Act of 1977 a long and variable lag, admittedly, between 1977 and 2007, but uh, nevertheless, at least within a certain theoretical framework, an entirely coherent view. Right? There is also the view that inequality did it, a view which has a lot more superficial attractiveness to people on the progressive side of the political spectrum, that was articulated in particular by uh, a Chicago business school professor, now the governor of the Reserve Bank of India, Raghuram Rajan, in his book, Fault Lines. And the characteristic aspect of Rajan's view was that uh, inequality, the gap between the poor and the rich, infused the poor with an unsavory degree of envy, which they then expressed by going to their banks and demanding and receiving loans uh, in order to enhance their consumption standards and make their lives more like the ones that they could observe on television or read in the celebrity magazines. Right? 
And the government accommodated these people uh, foolishly in its desire to uh, uh, win their votes. A very interesting story in which inequality appears almost in a cursory way at the beginning uh, and another institutional actor that you might think relevant, namely banks, does not appear at all. Then there is the view articulated very forcefully by a very close friend of mine and a member of the faculty of this great institution, Bill Black, which is that fraud did it. That the financial institutions were taken over essentially by criminal cabals and that they engineered their own destruction in a process of looting. And that view is of course true. And the question about it is whether it's embedded in a sufficiently rich explanatory framework. What enabled the fraud? Why did it come about when it just when it did? Were there larger conditions that make some episodes in history more fraudulent than others? I know that last night one of the participants in the panel said that fraud was not very important. Well, sorry, it was. I have listed these various views, therefore, in ascending order of usefulness and correspondence to fact. But it still seems to me that all monocausal explanations are a bit too easy. They suggest that in the absence of specific causal uh, forces or impetus, the crisis would not have happened. That you could simply remove something, remove the inequality, control the fraud, and that things would have gone on as before. And that strikes me as a view which is at least open to question. So we should turn to ways of thinking in which crisis is an endemic or at least a latent feature of the system. And these include the perspective of the uh, Marxian ec economist, which has much to commend it, but which leaves open the question as to why there are ever periods when the system is not in crisis. And I think uh, it's also true that the specific advance warnings of the Marxians were by and large focused on a type of crisis, namely of the dollar and the imperial system that didn't actually happen on this occasion. Closer to the hearts of this audience and with distinguished representatives of these points of view uh, sprinkled in the front rows here, I'm going to be, try to be quite careful. There are two important uh, schools that I uh, identify in the book as the backwater profits. That is to say, eco economics is divided between the freshwater, the saltwater, and the backwater. Uh, the point, and I, 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 that I appeal to, uh, uh, to the trained biologist in the room, Professor Davidson, for verification on this, uh, but I, the point that I allege is that a biologist will tell you that both saltwater and freshwater are comparatively state, uh, sterile and that in the backwater is where evolution actually occurs. <laughs> he confirms this view. I can take, I take that to the bank. Uh, but there were two principal backwater positions. One of them is associated with uh, Wynne Godley and with the Levy Institute uh, teams that have uh, uh, followed in Wynne's tradition and emphasizes unsustainable trends imbalances and Stein's law, Herb Stein, Richard Nixon's chief economic advisor who famously said, when a trend cannot continue, it will stop. <laughs> Godlian, and I, I use that word, it always reminds me that godliness was next to Keynesliness. Uh, stock flow consistent models are, I think, clearly a major advance. But they still leave open the question of what unsustainable actually means. Uh, whether specific balances have to revert to zero in the long run in a world where the limits, let's say, on the People's Bank of China's accumulation of uh, balances in the securities account, U.S. Treasury bonds and bills, 
remains essentially opaque and is therefore subject to the decision making of one very large actor whose motives are uh, not fully known or completely predictable. And I think a similar uh, observation can be made about this question of imbalances in Europe. Uh, it baffles me why ex ante one should expect or why it should be necessary for the 27 members of the European Union or whatever the number is of the Eurozone uh, to achieve over any uh, finite period of time a balance in their external accounts. And in fact, no such requirement is imposed upon American states and the accounts are not even kept. The issue there is not, therefore, whether imbalances have to be removed, but whether there are ways of coping with the fact that they will never be removed. Whether there are ways of getting around uh, the uh, institutional and policy conditions that make them matter. And then there is the Minsky view, that other great um, post-Keynesian tradition represented here, with its implicit nonlinear dynamics, um, beautifully developed by Barclay Rosser, who will be here late tonight and tomorrow, uh, and with its phase transitions, that is to say systems that within their own structure have the capacity to move from one state to the next, as uh, water does from steam to liquid to ice. Right? Uh, and this is, of course, Minsky's hedge, speculative, and Ponzi phases, to which I would add a fourth phase derived from William K. Black and from Akerlof and Romer, namely looting. Right? Seems to me, and Minsky didn't develop this, and for Minsky, the Ponzi phase although it has this evocative frisson of association with one of the great crooks of all time, is not necessarily a criminal one. It is something that you slip into in transition from the speculative phase, perhaps without even realizing it. But looting is the rational insider's reaction to the Ponzi state. Right? It's what the Soviets brilliantly called nomenclatura privatization. Right? It is the stripping of capital assets, financial or non-financial assets, uh, in a situation where you recognize that the debt structure is going to collapse and you know it before anybody else does. Okay? This is especially possible in a permissive legal climate. Uh, it is said that one should not speak ill of the resigned uh, but I have often wondered how much different and better the uh, Obama administration might have been if only Eric Holder had been alive. <laughs> With that backdrop, let me offer and advance yet another framework, uh, which uh, my sometime collaborator from the wilds of northern British Columbia, Jing Chen, and I call a biophysical framework. Biophysical because it draws on basic principles from biological and physical realms, and because it actually attempts to respect the laws of thermodynamics. The basic principle is that large-scale economic systems achieve efficiency by making long-term investments that commit them to paying out fixed costs. And this is the source of successful economic development, essentially. But that larger systems are fragile, more fragile than smaller and less well-developed ones because the margin of surplus depends on the cost of resources, notably on the energy return on investment. This is true of any functioning entity. It's true of animals. It's true of companies. It's true of machines. It's true of countries. And there are conditions 
when resource costs rise or when they are high, when a lower burden of fixed costs conveys advantages a more profitable and sustainable system. This is, I think, just an elaboration of the uh, observation about cash in and cash out that Paul Davidson uh, reminded of us, us of just an hour or so ago. It's essentially the same thing. You're committed to certain expenditures, some of which occur at money rates that you cannot predict and control, and you can operate only so long as those commitments are within the range of your uh, revenues. So with this framework in mind, I think it's possible to divide the entire post-war period into, let's say, three major um, segments. The first one, 1945 until roughly 1970, was a period of low resource costs, the opening up of all kinds of new economic possibilities, economic growth practically for the entire world, with somewhat higher rates for the developing than for the developed countries, great expansion of trade, a stable, in many cases, actually uh, more equalizing distribution of income. It's what the Mexican called the period of, of stabilizing development. Uh, and a growth theory that emerged out of Cambridge, Massachusetts in those days, which completely ignored the resource question, right, which was characterized by Bob Solow saying that uh, uh, the reason uh, that if God had wanted three factors of production, he would have made it easier to draw three-dimensional diagrams. I ask my students, and you should ask yours, uh, to go home at the end of that first day of production theory and bring you something made out of capital and labor. No resources, no materials can be used. Good luck with that. Okay, so that's the first segment, but it was something that you could get away with in this period up until 1970, when resource costs were considered to be a very trivial aspect of the larger picture. Then there was a decade of disruption and turbulence in which everybody got to know what OPEC was, what the oil price was, and uh, Paul Davidson once again uh, uh, made a considerable impact on the world by virtue of the fact that he was one of the very few uh, trained economists who knew anything about oil. Right? Uh, and then from 1980 to 2000, we, at least in the rich countries, made a point of forgetting it all once again. There had been a failed effort awkward in certain respects, to introduce the resources into economics in the 1970s. It became kind of a, a, an allergic topic or a subfield of truly dedicated people whose importance we now recognize. Uh, but from the early 1980s onward, the importance was once again obscured by very high uh, financial flows from the poor countries to the rich, debt crises as a result, collapse of commodity prices and therefore the return of low resource costs compounded by the collapse of the Soviet Union as empire and another wave of commodity dumping on the world economy, and therefore a world of uneven growth. And I've done a lot of work on inequality and a lot of work that has been basically oriented toward building up uh, measures and information and data and trying to figure out what the picture was. And I think I understand it now in this period. The picture was, a very, was in some ways very simply at the world level, a picture of rising incomes in the richer countries and non-rising or falling incomes in the poorer ones and increasing inequality for that reason. That's straightforward. Also within countries rising incomes for richer people, for people who control capital assets, and falling incomes for people who didn't. So rising inequality was uh, a, a consequence of the very different macroeconomic environment that continued up until 2000 and culminated in the great boom of the incomes of the richest of the rich, which was the finance sector and the information technology sector at that time. And then from 2000 onward, the world changed again. We returned, at least through 2008, to a period of unambiguously high resource costs. 
We had frantic efforts to maintain or to restore a growth rate, which it turned out couldn't be restored. Efforts that went with, through tax cuts in the Bush, early Bush administration that were at least somewhat associated with the war in Iraq in 2003, with great public expenditures in 2004, uh, and ultimately with this phenomenon of looting in, on a colossal scale in real estate finance. Pouring money in, getting some construction and some consumption expenditures back, but on terms that were certain, that were timed to explode, timed to collapse by the 228 and 327 mortgages, you could tell when you were going to hit the point where you either had to refinance the speculative phase or you would discover that you were in Ponzi. And, and maybe that beyond Ponzi, you would dis discover that the entire system had been looted to a fairly well, which turned out to be the case. And then the thing fell apart, as it will when people who have unpayable financial obligations realize that this is the case. And so there was a panic and a massive collapse of activity. And now, how do we think of these things? Well, we continue to speak of them as though the system that seemed to be functioning for the 50-year period, if you omit the 70s and forget about them, from the end of the Second World War to uh, the turn of the millennium, we're still functioning. We talk about potential growth, potential output. What is that? It is a projection of a trend built on the statistical record of a long period of time on the underlying assumption that the structure generating that trend hasn't changed. Right? We talk about the natural rate of unemployment or the NARU. Well, we don't in this room, but lots of people do. And what is that? It is the assumption that certain conditions of the labor market are underlying reality which will reassert themselves when the storm passes. By what mechanism of adjustment of real wages is never carefully explored uh, because it's not plausible. But there is an underlying assumption of normality associated with this. We even talk, some people even talk uh, in the shade of Newt Vixell of the natural rate of interest. Right. And so we're given to expect that there will be some return from the current zero on the managed rates to something approaching the historical pattern. We're not given a coherent explanation as to why that will happen or whether it can be made to happen without causing another massive financial disruption. Although we do recognize from time to time that when the Fed tries this or even talks about trying it or even hints about talking about trying it, that the disruptions are right there. So the return to normal recedes like a mirage, suggesting, if you've been paying attention for six years, that there might be something else at play, some barriers and limits, something beyond a simple failure to take the most aggressively Keynesian advice, or pseudo-vulgar Keynesian advice, uh, to stimulate, stimulate, a word which I heartily despise. And I suggest there are four such factors, uh, at least, but there are four anyway that I felt were worth talking about, uh, worth projecting in a book of this kind. The first is what I call the choke chain effect, which has to do not just with energy prices, but with their financialization. And with the fact that in a period when prices are rising, there are lots of ways to keep the oil in the ground or slow down the tankers or fill, fill up the storage tanks. Uh, and sell it a little later at a higher price, hoping that you get in before everybody else does and the price collapses. $148 in 2008 was the key example of that. And that, of course, is a drain on current purchasing power of people who are buying that product, right? which contributes to their financial stresses. We've got some relief mitigation of that at God knows what environmental cost from fracking, right? which is clearly an advantage for this community of the United States as opposed to Europe, which doesn't have it. Um, how long it will last, how much it will cost, remain questions 
that I think even the physicists, the geophysicists, don't have clear answers to. Second big issue, it seems to me, uh, is that uh, we really live in a much more unstable and we're moving into a progressively more unstable world political environment, world security environment. The Cold War up through 1991 was relatively stable mostly. You had two opposing systems which uh, were in competition with each other and had a certain performance discipline, especially we did, and we lasted that pretty well. And then you had a system after that where we operated under the impression that the United States could provide security for a globalizing world, and a lot of globalization took place under that system. And then we actually tested the proposition that military power can restore stability in Iraq, an urban setting, Afghanistan, a mountainous rural one, and we discovered, and military professionals know this as well as anybody, that the ability to do so is extraordinarily limited. And there we are. The rest of the world can see this very clearly, does see it very clearly, and recognizes that we're not going to be in a position to provide the same level of long-term confidence in the security of the world system that has existed for the last 60 years. And the third is this question of technological change. Hotly discussed and contested in, econ in economics, uh, and I certainly have been, it was an early critic 20 years ago of the idea that it was technology that was behind the rising inequality in any, in any skill-related sense. But it does seem to me clear that technological change changes the conditions in labor markets and change that this type of technological change that we are living with today is quite different from the predominant mode in the 20th century. In the 20th century, we can talk about the transportation revolution, which replaced horses with motorized transport. All right. Uh, Veblen's great observation about trucks and, uh, and the army in World War I, which was that uh, invention is the mother of necessity. Um, the, uh, but when you look at that body of technological change, you, you had a lot of downstream employment that was created. Roads had to be built and maintained. Machinery had to be built and maintained. You have a whole spectrum of ancillary industries which created this large part of the service sector and indeed patterns of life were changed in ways which created lots and lots of employment. Right? It wasn't in fact so good for one other previously employed population, namely the horses. Right? But we tend to forget about them. The digital revolution does not, so far as I can tell, create this massive downstream uh, need for human employment. Right? And it reduces the requirements for manpower in the profit-making sector by substantial amounts. Now, it's true that the ratio of labor to capital hasn't changed very much, but that's because the capital has also become very cheap. Right? And I think anybody who goes in is, is in an information-based industry, as we all are, including the deeply threatened professorate, knows that this is the case. But I give you just one other example that I like to use, which is the uh, effect of these things on the air freight business between China and the United States. What's that effect? Well, what is obvious fact about smartphones is that they're very small. You can put an awful lot of them in a single airplane. So Federal Express's pilots and its equipment lie idle compared to what they were using before. Very simple. That sort of change is something that is ongoing and has creating, is contributing to the declining role of private profit-making employment in the economy. And the fourth major force that I discuss in the book is the dysfunction of the financial sector, an institutional failure. Uh, a, we've gone through a process in which we save financial institutions by greatly concentrating them, greatly increasing their uh, 
their presence in the economy and their political power, but without repairing their basic failure to provide the impetus for economic activity that creates jobs or serves social purposes. And here is where I, I think in a, in a strong way, part company from the simple stimulus approach uh, or the QE approach, the idea that if you give the banks money, they will have money to lend. Banks, as Minsky always said, are not money lenders. They don't need money in order to lend. Um, but the, uh, the basic um, metaphor I would use here is that we don't face a vehicle with a shortage of fuel. We have one with a melted transmission. Adding fuel to such a car is not going to make it run. Entirely straightforward. Whether the vehicle can be repaired at all, given the damage already done to it, seems to me, at this stage, given the politics and some of the complexities of actually regulating institutions of this scale, an open question. I'm not sure that can be repaired. I don't think we're making significant progress. And so that strikes me as an enormous fixed cost, which we continue to pay, and which acts as a burden on every other form of business, including the, uh, the businesses that we really need to serve purposes that we actually have. Therefore, it is both structural and financial. I conflate the two in that sector. Finally, I have the word here, wither with an H. What does this imply? If I'm right about these things, what does it imply for uh, what we should be doing, what should we should be thinking about going forward? I'll just make a few very quick points and then I'll wrap it up. First is that the value of social insurance programs under these conditions goes up, not down. And that it's very clear if you compare the United States to Europe that a saving grace in this country is the fact that the institutions that were created in the 20th century and the Great Society and in the New Deal continued by and large to function and greatly increased uh, payments in the immediate crisis all across the country, cushioning a large share of the population from its direct income loss. You couldn't cushion them from the loss of their, uh, uh, their retirement accounts or their value of their houses, but you could replace the lost incomes, and a lot of it was, in fact, replaced, which was not the case in Greece or Portugal or Ireland, where austerity meant that the very weak programs that already existed had to be cut in the crisis. A very big difference and greatly, uh, I think, emphasizes the importance of mounting a political defense of Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, unemployment insurance, the whole spectrum of core social insurance programs that were established in the Depression and in the post-war period. The second point is that I think this whole story emphasizes the need for standards. Um, and standards are an essential feature of a modern economy. Standards for wages, I'm in favor of a major increase in the minimum wage. Uh, standards for working conditions, standards for the environment, standards for the financial sector. We just have to face the fact that this whole debate over getting government out of the economy was a formula for producing disaster and regression. And we have to be clear that that uh, claim has to be met head on and countered repeatedly. Third point is that without a private sector self-confident enough to undertake long-term investment, then the public sector or stable institutions, nonprofit institutions, have to do that work. Uh, appropriate to the conditions and aimed particularly at providing common consumption goods that can enhance living standards in a way that is shared broadly in the population and done very efficiently. This is, gets back to the, to the question of social balance that my father wrote about in 1958 of private affluence and public squalor. Okay. Fourth, we clearly need jobs that can't be digitized. And I'm very proud of my son who's become a cook. Okay. It's very sensible. People will always need to eat. But beyond that, there are 
vast areas where we have unmet needs, unmet needs as far as um, our living structures, as far as the environment, but especially as far as caring for fellow citizens is, are concerned. And we need to have institutions that can employ people to do those things and to do them in a useful and, and, and straightforward way. To provide home care, for example, which we presently don't do for the elderly. Right? You could employ a great many people in that kind of work, and that's, kind, that's work which can be professional and cannot be converted into uh, the work of an information processing machine. And then finally, uh, I would suggest uh, that we need urgently to get economists like myself off the stage uh, and to bring into these forums people who have done a deep study and can speak effectively to the question of what we actually should do uh, to meet the challenge of climate change. Because if we don't do that, good luck to us all and to our descendants. Thank you very much indeed. have a simple question. Uh, so you speak of the end of normal, while other people speak of the new normal. Um, why and why not? Ah, very uh, straightforward question. Why the end of normal and not the new normal, apart from the fact that the new normal is someone else's coinage and I don't much like it. <laughs> uh, but the end of normal and I look again, once again, at somehow this evening I find myself looking at Professor Davidson again and again and again. But the end of normal evokes existential or Keynesian uncertainty. Is that not a good enough reason? Uh, Jamie, um, given that you mentioned the cycles to some extent, the increasing resource costs as being one of the triggers making cash outflow going higher than cash inflow. And I'm just, um, I'm doing some research on Caldor's commodity reserve currency, the introduction of a new currency backed by commodities. I'm wondering if we can't try to stimulate industrialization and growth in the rest of the world to create world growth and perhaps that's by supporting and stabilizing at a higher rate commodities. Sorry, stabilizing commodities at a higher rate? Yeah. Well, yeah. At a, st at a sustainable rate but higher and more stable to give incomes, to basically redistribute income to the south. Well, the period after 2000 and up until the crisis and even beyond was such a period when commodity prices were substantially higher and you had growth in the southern economies compared to the northern ones uh, and you had no financial crisis in places that were formally prone to it like South America. So this was the South American summer. Uh, the um, question I have is, uh, how does one take the financial element and the speculative element out of the current financial system when it is a, um, a major way that the banking institutions that we have make money? All right? That's what that's what they do is is they they operate on volatility. So the, here's the tension between stabilization, which you and I like 
and volatility which they like in a world in which you and I are professors and they are bankers. All right? So that's, 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 I throw that back to you and, and when you have a solution, could you email it to me because I don't. Well, um, Maybe I should come to your paper. Your paper's tomorrow, isn't it? No, it was yesterday. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk later. <laughs> we'll talk later, yeah. Hi. Um, so, um, about the political implications. Um, so, I would say that um, the fact that the Fed stabilized the financial markets to the extent that it did prevented uh, a Great Depression of the 30s. But at the same time, politically, it's made impossible or, or made it harder for progressives to um, do what uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt did in, in the 30s, uh, even though it was a steep learning curve for him. Um, I guess it would have been a steep learning curve for Obama, too. But um, w like, given that we're now in this like, new normal of stagnation, um, do you see any chance of a political change to implement the program that that you suggest? Um, I mean, I see Elizabeth Warren there, but like, not convinced. Like, she's not running. Like, even if she were running, could she actually convince the electorate? Um, so, how could how how do we get there politically? Uh, okay, on the first point, which has to do with the Federal Reserve, I'm I'm reluctant to second guess. Uh, the actions that were taken given the alternatives at the time. Uh, but uh, I think the major force that saved the U.S. economy was not the Federal Reserve. It was the automatic stabilizers, stabilizers built into the social insurance programs. That's what saved the U.S. economy. That's what allowed people to continue to consume and prevented a, a, a descent into deep destitution that would otherwise have occurred. That's the difference between us and our ancestors in the 1930s who did not have social security, did not have health insurance, did not have unemployment insurance, did not have deposit insurance, and lost everything, including the means of living, of basic living. So this is a huge difference. What the Fed did was to stabilize the balance sheets of the, of the banking institutions on the premise that they would then become socially useful, which hasn't happened. And that's, uh, that, I think, is better than having another massive set of collapses, maybe. Although I'm not even sure of that, because it strikes me that, in retrospect, if we'd had the collapses, we could have gotten the institutions down to size, and that's now practically impossible. On the question of hope, uh, you know, uh, Bill Black said something to me years ago that, quoting William of Orange, that it's not necessary to hope in order to persevere, and I stick to that. I, d I, d I don't offer hope, frankly. Uh, I just say, get, keep, keep, keep working at it, and, you know, if you get lucky, you'll feel good at the end, but maybe you won't. Don't, don't get your hopes up. Uh, Professor Galbraith, you uh, suggested in passing that there might not be, that we can't assume that there's a natural interest rate and, and that there'll be a natural reversion to, uh, I guess, a long-term average rate. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, are, are you suggesting that we could face uh, these interest rates for a long period of time? Because I, I write about retirement financing and uh, the insurance comp life insurance companies, and, and there would be deep ramifications for them uh, right, you're we, absolutely right. We faced it for a long time. Yeah, you're absolutely right. No, I, and I think that when you have, I mean, what's the long-term interest rate? It's the it's the expected sequence of short-term interest rates with a little bit of uh, of liquidity preference uh, tossed into it, All right? And it's clear that we have built up a substantial expectation that the short rates are going to stay low because the consequence of raising them is an inverted yield curve and a lot of financial uh, disorder, right? And even talk, I mean, this is an area where I feel a deep burden of quasi-responsibility because I was the architect of the Humphrey Hawkins hearings which created this dialogue between the Fed and the Congress and by extension created this modern Federal Reserve practice of trying to tell people about what it's doing. Before 1975, before we passed H. Conrad's 133 in the House in, in April of 1975, I think it was, there was no such. The Fed was completely hermetically sealed. There were no regular consultations. It's since become this big 
global theater and they, you know central bankers preen themselves on how effectively they communicate to them. Well now they're trapped because if every, every word that every syllable that they issue is is parsed like a Talmudic script <laughs> uh, then they find that uh, even changing a, a, the punctuation on the page uh, is uh, invested with the speculative significance. And so they do that and the, and the Turkish lira and the Argentine peso and the South African rand all go to hell. Um, and you know, then they say, oh, well, uh, guess what? We, we didn't mean to trigger derivative payouts or whatever else it might be that's going to cause uh, the system to, to collapse. And so they back off. And I think that process has been going on for a while, and probably will go on for a while longer, until such time as they decide to bull their way through and they allow a disaster to happen, right? Which is perhaps the alternative. Well, maybe that's going on now, you know? Maybe that maybe we're just starting on that. But uh, so I'm not saying they will do this forever. But I'm saying when they 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 they've been doing it for a long time. So that's the state of expectation about what they're going to do. And when they start changing. <gasps> It's going to not be pretty. That's my view. And yes, I sympathize very greatly with your, with your clients who are, uh, who have expected rates of return built into their payouts that are probably not going to be achievable. Jamie, uh, you talked about. Uh, all right. Oh, oh. Uh, I, I, I've been teasing. Yeah, all you talked time. about. I figured uh, there would come a time when he would take his uh, uh, take his. Uh, you talked about what happened to horses. Uh, can you can you lean into the microphone, Paul? You talked about what happened to horses in the 20th century. Question but is. But you need to lean into the microphone and speak into it too. <laughs> okay. You <laughs> talked about what happened to horses in the 20th century. Right. The question is: Some people claim that automation is going to do the same thing to manual labor in the 21st century. Now, the question that I have is as follows. Your social insurance things give people income without them necessarily contributing to production in the same period. Social Security, Medicare, sure. and so on and so forth. Is that something that we have to look forward for? In other words, is automation going to create make most workers the equivalent of horses of the, at the beginning of the 20th century, they're not going to be able to get jobs. How are you going to create jobs? Now, you said, well, chefs, uh, there's always going to be a need for chefs. I'm not so sure that you couldn't get robotic chefs to, to cook. I, I just called to your attention a, a movie by Woody Allen called Sleepers, in which everything is produced by robots. That, yes. and the, my question is, well, if that was to occur, how would anybody buy the service of robots? Well, one of, one of the great tragedies of our time is the arrival of the automated coffee making machine, which is a bad effect on coffee houses. But uh, the, uh, as I say, I think the, the automated, the, the rise of mechanical a industry in the 20th century created a lot of human employment related to the tending of machines, uh, which horses couldn't have done. And so actually was, it created an expectation amongst economists that technology was always like that. And I think there's no reason to believe that technology is always like that. In the case of solid state technologies, we have very little repair. The actual manufacturer is largely offshore. Uh, and the software is updated by electronically across fiber optic cables which don't decay very rapidly either. So lots of the heat and friction and mechanical stuff uh, that used to be employment creating just isn't present. And so I think that's the, that, that is going. And then it, what also happens as time goes on is that businesses work out new ways of applying this technology. Uh, so they, you get waves of, of industries of checkout clerks disappear, for example, and this kind of thing. Um, and um, they, uh, and they tend to do this in the wake of a of, of a slump. In the slump, they lay off workers, and then when demand re revives, they bring back machines. There's also a tax angle, 
the machines aren't taxed or get tax benefits and people continually are taxed and require health insurance and that kind of thing. So there's, there's my Georgist friends constantly remind me that the tax, correctly, that the tax system has a role in this. So yes, I think that we have in the profit making sector a substantially smaller part of the labor force required to do these things. Now is that bad? No, it's not bad. It's not any worse than ha requiring fewer farmers or fewer manufacturing workers. Uh, but the problem is you've got to have institutions that can provide work uh, for meaningful, important, useful work for people for part of their lives and s substantial uh, retirement income and, so and protection against adverse events, sickness, later on. And I like, I'm not a fan, to be honest, of basic income grant. Uh, irrespective of whether you work or not. I think a social norm is you have a certain period in which you are in training, a certain period in which you are expected to work if you can, and a certain period in which you are let off from it. And that I, it doesn't bother me that that, that that third period is when you're older. Uh, in fact, you sort of look forward to it and you take more risks when you're working if your retirement down the road is basically provided for. So uh, all of that strikes me as a very reasonable way to, to do it. There's not a single solution, but the two things would be to create institutions that absorb labor, and I think stable nonprofit institutions are, 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 have some advantages over government ones because they're not under constant legislative attack. They're insulated from it. Uh, and that's the difference between American universities and European ones. I mean, it's just clear if you go back and forth between the two. Uh, I mean, not to say that American universities aren't under some stress, but compared to the French, just go check. Uh, and uh, the other is, uh, uh, as I say, the, uh, uh, the expanding, very s simply administered, cheaply administered social insurance programs, which basically provide the kind of, they're, they're a Keynesian device because they provide the stable purchasing power for the elderly population. They're a Keynesian device and they're also the greatest triumph, I think, in the history of supply-side economics. Uh, I'm not a great fan of supply-side economics as a concept, but I've noticed that over Social Security was created, what, almost 80 years ago, uh, and when you started paying older people to live, they continued living. <laughs> the incentive was there. You see, you wrote them a check every month that they stayed alive, uh, and, you know, another month went by and they stayed alive. You know, it had something to do with whether they could eat, which they like to do, you know, old people. Uh, but basically it was a financial incentive to exp expand life expectancy and the greatest success in the history of the world. Well, uh, following that up... Uh, okay, you still have to lean into the microphone okay. and, and, and speak to it. Following that up, the, uh, if we get more and more automated... No, you still have to lean in and speak. We, we, if we get more and more automated and lose manual jobs, more of the income that is generated by production is going to go to capital. Now there is uh, some people like Kelso and others who have argued that somehow or other we have to take the income from capital and provide not only to the shareholders but labor as a shareholder in capital in some sense. I'm not sure. How, in other words, how are you going to get income to people who aren't 65 years old, who, whose jobs have disappeared and they don't have, you know, and, and a lot of mainstream people say, well, they have to go and be up, upgrade their skills, get more education and so on and so forth. Well, education, once you get past the public school system, is costly. So you have to have income in order to buy education. If you don't have a job, how in the world are you going to even go to the University of uh, Missouri in Kansas City if you don't have enough to pay for the income? I, I'm all in favor of writing checks to students. <laughs> I, I, thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't, I don't see why this should be an un unpaid activity or why it should be necessarily tied to your family, family means. Right? I mean, you qualify for the university, why not? Why isn't there a check writing facility that will give you income th so that you can pay for it? I don't see that. There's no mechanical problem associated with that. We pay soldiers, why don't we pay students? Okay, great. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I got my undergraduate degree, it cost me $5 a year at, the, at Brooklyn College, so uh, somebody was paying for that. that. That's, that's another mechanism, but I, 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 I like having it flow through uh, the, the, the student, it makes the student feel better. 
makes the faculty feel better. <laughs> okay, thank you. Cool, jump in there. Uh, professor, uh, the question I'm going to ask might be kind of controversial. Uh, you too. I, 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 I got constantly reminded, Professor Davidson, you have to lean into that microphone and speak into it. Sorry. Um, That's better. There you are. <laughs> um, not, my question's a little controversial. A little controversial. Uh, I talked with my father about it before I went to this presentation. But um, in your opinion, do you think that the colleges raising their prices of tuition is a good idea because when I think about it after listening to you talk a lot of the stuff that schools are upgrading with like um, new electronics and more and more commuters can actually be replaced by old ways of teaching like a, a teacher could use a uh, projector to teach his class, but when in reality he could save a lot of money just by having the teacher teach the class himself. It makes me feel like there's a lot of things that the college uh, uses the money for that doesn't seem necessary and that there could be a better way and in return could lower the price of tuition. I, I think there's a lot to what you say. Um, I'm, uh, colleges do a lot of bidding up the facilities in order to justify bidding up the tuition and vice versa. The two things are, are, are uh, go pari passu. Uh, and I fully sympathize on the technology angle. Uh, and in fact, uh, I greatly regretted the disappearance of the chalkboard. Uh, in spite of the fact that it left a certain amount of dust on my coat, uh, and I, I'm when the when the uh, magic marker goes away on the whiteboard, I will be even more unhappy. Uh, and at some point, I will just give up and start talking to the students directly. Uh, but that's as far as I'm going to go. Magic markers on whiteboards strike me as a as as a good technological compromise for someone of my age and talents. Uh, so I'm with you. I'm, I'm with you on that. PowerPoint is. Um, a, a power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts in a very pointed way. <laughs> My first point you might not like to hear. The more I ponder on the title of your book, the more I think it's not a good title. And um, of course, every author who hears that his title is not good is not in a good mood. But uh, if you say the end of normal, um, we all know the past was not normal. And don't we have to turn to normal, to return to normal? So the past period of financialization, of financial globalization, of uh, the crowding out of productive industry and the uh, oversizing of uh, the financial industries in the US, all this was not normal. This has to end. And could you, could you, you, could you it, just say that again with, a, with your mouth a little closer to the microphone? It? I eat it up already. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I say it again. The end of normal, perhaps you, we should return to normal because the, the age of financialization, of oversizing of the financial sector, deindustrialization in the US, this has to be ended. Second point, talking about technological miracles in the future. If you do this, you should also talk about productivity increases and then productivity-led wage increases. So if I hear that since the end of the 1960s, ordinary workers in the US have not earned more money, isn't there an enormous greed for consumption, for higher wages, therefore for production in this country, and not only by excessive yeah, that's, that's imports. A, that's another and more complicated question. Let, let me come back to the normal issue. Which, yeah, I mean, what it is related. The second yeah, point no, is normalization. In a country I, where, I you, where you have productivity increases but no wage increases, there is nothing normal about that. It must be normal in that way. Yeah, okay, let, let me come back to the, what your, your question, or the comment on the normal, on the question of what is normal, uh, is a question about how long a historical frame uh, one should be applying here. And the one I chose 
is a, basically the statistical history that uh, built up in the post-war period, which created a certain expectation of normality. Uh, and I actually developed this theme immediately after the crisis. Uh, I, I published an essay in the Washington Monthly entitled No Return to Normal. Uh, so the title is a contraction basically of that. Uh, challenging the automatic assumption of economists that you would, uh, that the economy would over three or five years revert to trend either on its own or with assistance. Uh, and I think that's, that's basically the framing, and I, we could, you could choose a different one, but that's the one I happen to choose. On the question of wages and productivity, uh, it is true that in some, let's say, metaphysical sense, uh, the technological change enhances productivity, it enhances productive potential, and it reduces the cost of certain kinds of, uh, of important areas of economic activity. So it makes us all, in some sense, better off, uh, but it does so at the cost of depriving large segments of the population of the means of living. Uh, and that's the problem that has to be addressed. Once you have incomes in the hands of people, then they can, uh, they can play on their smartphones to their heart's content, uh, and they will no doubt enjoy that. Uh, but it is not obvious to me that the uh, improvement in living standards here will show up in productivity statistics. Whether it will or it won't depends in part upon how the price indices are constructed. But it also depends upon whether the activities that result are remain in the market. Uh, and one of the things that happened in the 20th century was that a lot of activities that were out of the market, household activities, transportation activities, were marketized. And that added to GDP growth, right? even though it might not have been any real difference in the way people lived. But now you have a technological change that's moving things out of the market. Information processing, communication, uh, all kinds of things have been moved to a simple fixed cost structure with no marginal cost or activity to send uh, uh, to, uh, to no marginal cost to additional uh, bandwidth. And that means, it seems to me, that the GDP uh, is growth, which is an artificial construct but important to your measure of productivity, is going to become quite uh, problematic to capture what is the real welfare benefit of these of this particular form of technological change. So I think the productivity issue is one which is subtle and interesting and important, but we need to be aware of that the technology really is quite different. On the question, finally, of wages, uh, the median wage argument uh, is one which I think has a certain fatal attractiveness for uh, liberal-minded uh, economists and people who play with economic statistics, but I don't think it actually reflects the experience of any of uh, individual living people. And the reason is you can imagine a society where the median was completely flat, never changed, and everybody gets a pay increase every year, starts low, ends high, and retires, right? There's nothing inconsistent about that. So you can have a world in which every individual is better off every year and the median never changes. And you can also have a world in which people are coming into the labor force, women are coming in, minorities are coming in, immigrants are coming in, the median is being pulled to the right, that is to say, be made to look flat, in spite of the fact that everybody is better off than they were before. I'm not saying that's the world we actually live in, but I'm saying that the, to, to hang your hat on the median wage is a, uh, make yourself vulnerable to a certain amount of statistical illusion. Uh, Professor Galbraith, um, my question kind of follows from the last um, question and your response to the question, uh, because it seems to me that it's not sufficient to just say um, from the period of 1970s to now, we see a, uh, an increase in the absolute quality of life. And I think that um, uh, we also need to take into account that um, it's, it's not simply that um, if I have another car tomorrow, I'll be better off, but it has to be put in a contest um, with, you know, comparison with other people. So income distribution, um, right, um, it's, it's not just um, about a simple matter of who gets more money. It's also a matter about 
the degradation of social relations, right? So it seems to me that the last um, 50 years, we see the you know divergence between productivity and um, uh, medium wage reflects that material abundance creates the condition for further exploitation and the predatory instinct of human. So I don't know how um, we should look at that, right? So if we study economics as the provisioning process of life, social provisioning process of life, it's not just in absolute material terms, but we also need to look at those social relations. And I wonder how you would um, no, look I, at that. I, I agree with that. On the technical questions, I repeat my, my, my previous answer, or I don't need to repeat it. Um, I'm not even sure I could reproduce it at this point. Uh, the, uh, but yes, I agree with you. This is a question of social relations. And for me, when I speak about the rise of inequality, uh, the thing that strikes me as most dramatic about it for our society is the complete uh, perversion of our political process uh, into a, a money-grubbing business uh, oriented toward a handful a uh, relative handful of very wealthy people. That is what the extraordinary peaks of income has permitted to happen. You always go and raise your money where the money is, and that's where it is. It has meant that social organizations, in particular trade unions or consumer organizations or environmental organizations or civil rights or women's rights organizations are all deeply downgraded in terms of what they can do in the political process in favor of a, of, of, uh, of people who are making their money in the financial markets or in the technology sector or a handful of other places. And that is uh, a, a fundamentally anti-democratic tendency in our society. Fundamentally anti-democratic. That actually troubles me a great deal more than the material issues because fundamentally, while we, you can address the material questions if you have sufficient amount of will, um, the political questions are uh, prevent you from doing that. It's all, all in one sentence in Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, which I always love to repeat, and I think since we're coming to the end of this, I'll just close on this. Wealth, as Mr. Hobbes says, is power. Particularly with that, as Mr. Hobbes says, stuck in the middle of the sentence, I think it's perfect. Thank you very much indeed.